When FX's Shogun first released, we already knew it would break our hearts by the end, given the series' beautiful yet cruel setting. But the penultimate episode of the show is possibly one of the most heart-wrenching ones in Shogun yet. Crimson Sky is a one-hour-long intense funeral march. The outcome feels like something we've been expecting all along, yet somehow it still hit me pretty hard at the end of this emotionally draining episode. As the major characters of the show bite the dust, Shogun is gearing up for its season finale. Crimson Sky is Mariko Sama's rodeo right from the beginning, and well, maybe after a 14-year-long wait, her wish will finally be granted to her. So, without wasting another moment, let's find out what course Mariko's life takes in this one. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Mariko's jaw-dropping stand against Ishido. In classic Shogun fashion, the episode begins with a 14-year-old flashback, where a heavily pregnant Mariko is running away amidst the snow, wanting to end her life after her father was disgraced. Plus, this isn't the first time she'd try to run away from her husband to end her life. Mariko is then taken inside a tent after being caught, where she meets Father Martin for the first time. Martin tries to console her and helps her navigate her grief under the canopy of Christianity. He renames her as Maria and gives her a rosary for comfort. This is probably the moment that led her to convert to Catholicism, a belief she clung to as a way of coping in her otherwise painful life. In the present day, Mariko remains calm and focused as she arrives in Osaka, refusing to open up to Blackthorn about what mission Toronaga had really sent her for. Yet she still maintains her duty as an interpreter and translates for Yabushige, who's not very thrilled about what awaits him. At this moment, Osaka is not exactly the most cheerful place, just like Toronaga's wife, Kiri and his consort Shizu, who bore him a new son, and many other members of noble families are being kept inside the castle as so-called guests. Although technically they're not prisoners, they're essentially confined with within the castle's walls. This pretense of formality allows Ishido to argue that he's not holding them as hostages for leverage against potential opponents. Basically, it's nothing more than a flimsy justification waiting to be exposed. On the other hand, Yabushige and Blackthorn prepare to address the situation at hand. Although Toronaga asked them to surrender on his behalf, many seem to doubt his plan. Even Yabushige is unaware of his hidden agendas. Yabushige then has a conversation with Lord Kiyama, and the former reveals his plan to support Ishido with all available artillery, which also includes John's expertise in European warfare. But Kiyama scoffs at this plan as he believes John's fate is for the church to decide. After mentioning that John's case is beyond the church's jurisdiction now, Yabushige leaves. John, on the other hand, tries to criticize Kiyama's faith, who then bluntly admits to valuing money over anything else. And because the Portuguese arrived first, they had their first chance to become his allies. In the next scene, Yabushige and John approach Ishido sincerely to present a proposal. Although Ishido is willing to listen, he first rebukes Yabushige for betraying him in the past. Yabushige then says he's prepared to accept the consequences, even if it means losing his head as long as his idea is heard. He then tries to offer Blackthorn as a gift to Ishido, given that the Englishman is a well-trained, skilled sailor. Sadly, this proposal doesn't go over well. Despite Blackthorn's respectful demeanor, Ishido dismisses it without a second thought. It's then Mariko's turn to speak, and as she steps forward, everything she says from now on reverberates throughout the entire episode. She starts with polite conversation with Ishido before addressing the main issue about Toronaga needing more time to mourn for his son. Mariko almost breaks her composure when Ishido callously responds that Toronaga has other sons too. So, what's the need to mourn one for so long? Mariko then speaks with Ochiba, who was once her childhood friend and is now Ishido's new fiancé. They reminisce about their past and the poetry competitions they used to join. Ochiba then mentions a poetry competition being held in the Dai Yoin's memory and asks Mariko to choose the first line. Without hesitation, Mariko starts a poem about a leafless branch in a cold, snowy evening. Now, you might find her chosen line of poem quite irrelevant, but soon it all becomes clear. Mariko eventually comes to the point of her presence in Osaka. Her request is pretty straightforward. She's been asked by her liege to escort Lady Kiri and Lady Shizu to meet their lord tomorrow. Despite Toronaga's imminent arrival, she insists on leaving. Plus, this request shouldn't pose a problem unless Ishido is prohibiting her from leaving. Ishido is in a pickle, given that if he stops her from leaving, it had become obvious that he's holding everyone as a hostage, and if he chooses to let her go, everyone else he's been falsely holding as prisoner would want to follow. 
He then shifts this responsibility to his regents, and Kiyama, of course, has no choice but to support Ishido. Now, Mariko has been complying with everything so far, but when Ishido refuses her the permission to leave, Mariko asserts her stand by openly calling him out on his disrespectful attitude. She goes on to mention her samurai lineage and her father's legacy, both of which are very dated and rich, unlike Ishido's clan. Although Mariko leaves the room after being asked to await a meeting with the regents, it's pretty clear the matter is far from over. Mariko puts up a fight against Ishido. Yabushige is clearly taken aback and upset by Mariko's outspokenness against Ishido in front of the entire council, especially when all of the heads are on the line and he's trying to gain the dictator's trust. He's also not dumb. He knows all this is a part of Toronaga's larger strategy. John, on the other hand, is simply trying to figure out what Mariko is really up to. Mariko's made up her mind to leave for Ido in the morning, even if Ishido's guards try to stop her. John understands her plan, yet he's forced by her to stay out of it, given that in this case, she has to risk her life in order to test the blade sharpness. Even Mariko's teenage son, Ryuji, seems to be brainwashed by the false propaganda coursing through the veins of Asaka. The fact that Kiyama has promised him a betrothal to Kiyama's granddaughter definitely shapes his opinion. Mariko is naturally surprised by this news and firmly tells him that he'll marry whoever Todanaga chooses for him. Like any typical teenager, Ryuji is embarrassed by his mom's actions, but in reality, he's fed up from hearing about his family's past and warns her that if she chooses to leave the castle without a approval, she might lose him as a son. Mariko faces a heavy burden as she tries to leave with her group the next day. She still remains determined, walking steadily toward the gate with an audience watching her fate unravel from the top of the building. This includes the regents, Blackthorn, Yabushige, Ochiba, and other members of the clan. Given that she never received an approval, Mariko is stopped by Ishido's men, leading to waves of violence that unfold with brutal elegance as Mariko's small army of samurais dwindle, leaving her to confront Ishido's forces alone. There's a lot of bloodshed. Mariko Mariko is forced to pick up the sword when Kiyama and Ono express their fear about opposing Ishido due to the risk of their families being killed. Even though Mariko doesn't come out victorious, she puts up a fierce fight. After admitting defeat, she leaves everyone shocked as she pledges to take her own life in shame that evening. As a samurai, she feels it's her duty, but as a Christian, she considers it a grave sin and asks Kiyama to support her as her second due to their shared faith. While Ono thinks it's just a ploy, Ochiba sees a different angle. Mariko's act could be a form of revenge, aiming to shame Ishido for his dictatorial ways and provoke rebellion amongst the nobles of Japan, even if it costs her life. Mariko and Ochiba finally meet. As things unfold, John is called for an audience with the young heir, which is actually just a ruse for Ochiba to meet Mariko, who arrives under the guise of being a translator. Ochiba tries to use her old childhood friendship with Mariko and subtly attempts to dissuade her from taking her own life. While one could see this concern as another act, Ochiba is genuinely worried and asks Mariko to put a stop to her games. Of course, Ochiba herself has the power to stop the entire situation from getting out of hand as the heir's mother and Mariko calls her out for that. As they leave, Blackthorn makes a final plea for Mariko to live for him, but she doesn't respond, well, at least not at that moment. As the seppuku ceremony approaches, Mariko shares a final confession with Father Martin. Now, Yabushige, either due to his disagreement with Mariko's plan or his inclination to scheme for personal gain, agrees to help Ishido in some affair we don't know yet. Meanwhile, Blackthorn rebels by vandalizing a Karasansui garden expressing his frustration in a visible manner. When the time comes, Mariko prepares to commit seppuku, but Kiyama doesn't show up. So, Blackthorn is forced to take up Kiyama's place as Mariko's second. Just as Mariko is about to pierce her katana through her guts, Ishido arrives to unexpectedly grant her the permission to leave Osaka. This prompts all of Ishido's other so-called guests to plead for their departure as well. Despite Ishido's displeasure, he's powerless to stop them and ask them to submit a permit in order to put an end to the dramatic day. How does Shogun's Episode 9 end? As everyone prepares to leave Osaka in high spirits at the end of Shogun Episode 9, the evening takes a much darker turn. Although we see a very sensuous moment as John comes into Mariko's chamber and pillows together, the night is abruptly disrupted by Yabashige's schemes. So, remember when Ishido sent a guy to recruit Yabashige as his ally? Well, it seems like that part fully came to light when Yabashige killed someone to open up the castle's gates for a swarm of shinobi. The group came in with the aim to kill Tononaga's clan and kidnap Mariko. Things go horribly wrong when Blackthorn, Mariko, and the others try to defend themselves from the shinobi's relentless attacks, who were hell-bent on achieving their 
their mission by any means necessary. Now, Mariko is very well aware of their tactics and knows the lengths they would go to. So, they escape from the attackers and take refuge in a storehouse with sturdy doors, but soon they hear the sounds of bombs being set outside. Here, the religious themes return strongly as Mariko, in a white robe, stands before the doors with her arms stretched out, looking angelic. Even though Blackthorn pleads with her to seek shelter with the others so he can block the blast with a barricade, Mariko refuses to let death evade her this time. This is the dignified death she's always desired, not a botched seppuku or a forced joint suicide with a husband she doesn't even like. She declares her protest against Ishido's dishonorable attack, but before she can finish, the explosion cuts her off. Her body absorbs the impact, saving the others and just like that. Our beloved Mariko Sama, who was the heart of the series, is gone. Although I knew that Mariko's story would end this way, it still leaves a bitter taste for me. As Ochiba mentioned earlier, Mariko resented her fate because despite doing everything right, she was still condemned to a difficult life. Yeah, she did find solace in her moments of happiness with John, away from public scrutiny, and her sense of duty to Toronaga gave her life purpose. But still, was her death meaningful? In history, the death of an innocent noble person has often sparked protests against dictators. So, in my opinion, this was a sad but necessary evil. Mariko's death holds the possibility to move everyone to Toronaga's favor and then turn them against Ishido in the coming episode. What do you guys think? Let us know in the comment box below. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.